live team coverage from Lansing as Governor Snyder prepares his final State of the State. Hear what lawmakers are hoping he addresses. We're digging deeper into the weekend overdose of a local 13-year-old tonight. Hear from his superintendent and an addiction specialist on what's being done to address concerns. Will this remain? Some argue it's a piece of history. Others, that it violates the Constitution. We'll take you live to a meeting that could settle the matter once and for all. This is 7 and 4 News at 6. Well, we start tonight with a live look over the state capitol where we are now less than an hour away from hearing from Governor Snyder and his eighth and final State of the State address. We are expecting the governor to reflect on his past seven years in office, plus lay out his economic priorities for the year. Our political reporter Nick Manock joins us now live at the state capitol. Good evening, Nick. Good evening. We're live inside the state capitol. Within the hour, Governor Rick Snyder is going to exit his capitol office doors right here and make his way to the House chamber where he'll address the legislature. Now, within the last couple of hours, I sat down with Speaker of the House Tom Leonard. He says the governor needs to come to the table on an issue that is impacting hundreds of thousands of Michiganders, which is forgiving millions of dollars in drivers' responsibility fees. We also chatted with Senator Curtis Hertel, a Democrat from East Lansing, who says Governor Rick Snyder's tenure deserves an incomplete because our roads are still in disrepair. Take a listen. Well, you know, I'd love to hear him talk about a road plan that will actually fix our crumbling infrastructure. I'd love to hear him talk about making college affordable. I'd love to hear him about improving our classrooms. Uh, in reality, uh, we've had seven years and uh, I haven't seen those things happen yet. But I also hope he focuses on mental health reform. That's been a top priority for myself and the House of Representatives. I hope he focuses on this driver responsibility fee issue. We've got over 300,000 of our citizens who are not legally driving because they are being burdened by these fees. This is something that we need to address. Now, Speaker Leonard told me tonight that he hopes the governor can get behind House Republicans. At the state capitol, Nick Minock. All right, thanks, Nick. 7 and 4's Mara Thompson joins us now with our team coverage from the state capitol. Mara, you spoke with northern Michigan leaders about what they hope to hear from the governor tonight. What did they tell you? Mark, the director of government relations for the Traverse City Area Chamber of Commerce expects the governor to touch on the opioid crisis, but also talk a lot about infrastructure. Now, he says there are two topics that are extremely pertinent to northern Michigan when it comes to infrastructure. He says the first one is expanding broadband to rural areas, and the second one is the Brownfield Redevelopment Program, which was funded by a bond. Now, he says that program has helped, obviously, a lot of redevelopment in northern Michigan when it comes to contaminated sites. That bond is now up, and so he's hoping the governor will talk about the future of that program. It's been a very important program for Northern Michigan, and it's something that we want to see continue. We know that there are still plenty of contaminated sites around Northern Michigan, uh, so we, we want to be a part of the solution for whatever we're going to be doing moving forward, whether it's a new bond, um, funding coming from elsewhere. Um, what, what have you, but we, we want to be part of that solution. Wood said he doesn't expect the governor to touch on Enbridge's line five, but he says it's not out of the question. Now the address is set to get start here, started here in less than an hour. We'll have reaction at 11 from our local lawmakers as well as talk to a family from northern Michigan about why they were invited to this year's address. Reporting live in Lansing, Mara Thompson, 7 and 4 News. All right, thanks, Mara. If you would like to watch the State of the State address, we can stream it live on our website, upnorthlive.com. New details tonight. We're learning more about how a 13-year-old boy may have gotten his hands on a drug that led to an overdose. The boy was found unresponsive at a home in Vanderbilt after deputies say he ingested liquid methadone. First responders saved his life with the overdose reversal drug Narcan. A second teen at the home also had the drug in her system. 7 and 4's Connor Hansen spoke to the Otsego County Undersheriff. He joins us now live from Otsego County. Connor, could the person the drugs were Prescribed to be in trouble here? Kristen, the Sheriff's Department told me that so far in the investigation, it does not appear that any of the adults were at fault here, that the, that the two teens likely found and used the methadone on purpose. 
On Saturday afternoon at a home in Vanderbilt, the Otsego County Sheriff's Department and EMS were called to a possible overdose. The victim, a 13-year-old boy, and the caller, a girl who also had methadone in her system. Right away, deputies gave the boy Narcan, which likely saved his life. It's very possible it could have been fatal um, due to the quick action of deputies realizing the situation and then taking the action they did helped. The sheriff's department says it's the law that methadone outside a clinic needs to be locked in a lockbox. So far in the investigation, deputies say it appears the drugs were appropriately locked up by the adult who it was prescribed to. Even though it's still an ongoing investigation, it appears as though the juveniles took this on purpose. Um, it appears as though the people that were in the residence that were prescribed this medication were in possession of it legally. They were okay to have it. But it appears as though the juveniles gained access to that somehow. We're still trying to determine that. In the small community of Vanderbilt, many are in shock. I think any time that a, a situation like this happens, everybody's surprised. Um, we try to believe that this kind of thing isn't happening in our community. But the fact is, you know, we, we hear that this is really happening everywhere. Addiction experts at Harbor Hall and Petoskey say methadone is widely used to treat people who are fighting opiate addiction. They say it's become more common for teens to experiment with different opioids. Over the past decade, the answer is yes. There's been a trend upward um, with kids that are experimenting with opioids. Um, recently, the past two years, three years, um, uh, we have seen things kind of flatten out. The Sheriff's Department says this investigation is ongoing. Nobody has been arrested or charged with a crime. Reporting live in Otsego County, Connor Hansen, 7 and 4 News. Thanks, Connor. Both teens were released from the hospital and have recovered. An update tonight out of Crawford County. A man accused of killing his longtime girlfriend is now facing an additional charge in an open murder case. John O'Connor's charged with open murder and a second charge of disinterment, mutilation, defacement, or carrying away of a human body. It stems from the death of Michelle Kokulski, who was reported missing on December 7th. While questioning O'Connor, deputies say he confessed to deputies that he killed Kokulski, but that it was an accident. O'Connor's due back in court on February 9th. If convicted, he faces life in prison without the possibility of parole. The Alpena County Sheriff's Office says a 70-year-old man died in that crash in Alpena County we told you about on Wednesday. The crash happened on M32 near Sportsman Drive yesterday afternoon. Deputies say the man lost control of his Chevy HHR and hit a tractor trailer. He was pronounced dead at the scene. In Grand Traverse County, a family of four had to be taken to the hospital after an early morning house fire. Flames broke out around 4 a.m. at this home on South Long Lake Road in Long Lake Township. Firefighters say there was heavy smoke and flames when they got there. The inside of the home is badly damaged. Tonight, we're still working to learn the latest condition of the family members. Severe weather across the country causing a huge blood shortage. That, according to the American Red Cross, more than 550 blood drives nationwide have been forced to cancel this month, causing more than 16,000 blood and platelet donations to go uncollected. In Michigan, 10 blood drives were forced to cancel due to weather alone, causing 335 donations to go uncollected. The bitter cold and busier flu season have also stopped people from donating. The American Red Cross is now calling the situation critical. Recent winter storms have certainly had a what... number of blood drives, a lot of on the East Coast, uh, many here in Michigan as well. Um, so, I mean, it's expected. Um, but again, when we get to the point where uh, donations uh, and blood products are going to hospitals faster than our volunteer donors are actually donating them, that's when it gets to be a real serious issue. All right, here is a list of some upcoming blood drives in northern Michigan. There will be one at Petoskey Middle School on January 29th, another at St. Luke's Catholic Church in Bel Air on February 8th. There will also be a blood drive at Fletch's Buick GMC in Petoskey. Mm -hmm. That's on February 8th and another at the Elks Lodge in Traverse City on February 15th. For a complete list of upcoming Red Cross blood drives, you can head on over to our website, upnorthlive.com. The village of Kalkaska is now down a board trustee. Kathy Sanborn turned in her resignation letter on January 15th, and the board accepted that at a special meeting on January 18th. Sanborn told us today she doesn't think the village of Kalkaska is being represented well, and she feels there's more arguing happening than actually getting things accomplished. She said it wasn't an easy decision after serving in her position for two years, but that it was the decision she felt she had to make.
happening tonight in Mason County. Community members are coming together for a special meeting that could determine the fate of a historic yet controversial memorial. 7 and 4 Shelley Domchak joins us live from Pierre Marquette Township where the meeting is just about to kick off. Shelley, what's the memorial that sparked an intense debate? Kristen, it's the Father Pierre Marquette Memorial, but it's not the actual memorial that has raised concerns. It's the cross. A group called the Michigan Association of Civil Rights Activists say they received a complaint from someone in the community about the religious symbol. They say according to the Constitution, it should not be on publicly owned land. The co-founder filed a formal complaint tonight. The township board will hear from the public and their thoughts on possibly taking the cross down. The government is not allowed to own religious symbols and, and maintain them on public property. And this is a large 40-foot tall cross in the middle of a public park that is owned by the township of Pierre Marquette. The cross is maintained by the township. They just spent $75,000 this year to upgrade the cross. Um, and these are all prohibited under the Constitution. Ultimately, the board will vote whether or not to keep the cross when that does happen. The activist group says they could take legal action. Reporting live from Mason County, Shelley Domchek, 7 and 4 News. All right, thanks, Shelley. Shelley will be in that meeting tonight, and we will have a full report on 7 and 4 News at 11. Reminder, you can get the latest news, sports, and weather updates on our website, upnorthlive.com, 24 hours a day. Coming up, a popular snowmobile trail in northern Michigan back open for riding. Plus, a winter landmark in northern Michigan has returned. Find out where you can snap a picture with, well, believe it or not, the giant ice tree. Details coming up. Yeah, and the ice is going to stick around for a few days. Some colder weather back in the forecast, at least briefly, for a warm-up to end the week. We'll show you those temperatures after the break. I'm Jada Johnson with Big Boys TV, and the Fish and Game Report is sponsored by Johnson's Propane. Airport in Traverse City. TVC says 2017 passenger numbers are in and they've surpassed the record breaking ones from 2016 by 5.6%. Airport Director Kevin Klein credits the increase to larger aircrafts with more seats, the addition of a summer Dallas flight, and most of all, more local people using the airport. Whether you're a business traveler or a leisure traveler, um, I think our price comparisons are great. Um, with more seats, our fares have improved dramatically and continue to improve, but it's the convenience. And so our community is making the choice that this is their airport, and that's very important in the market today. Klein says more than 476,000 passengers flew through Cherry Capital in 2017. The goal, he says, is to eventually reach half a million. A snowmobile trail that's been closed for repairs in the Upper Peninsula is back open. The bridge on snowmobile trail number eight that's in Marquette County was shut down in mid-December while crews work to repair a support beam. Well, the bridge is northwest of Champion, not far from Van Riper State Park. You can find more information about the repair and the latest information on trail closures on our website, upnorthlive.com. If you're in Otsego County, you're driving through, or if you live there, stop by downtown Gaylord. The historic ice tree is standing tall in front of the Otsego County building. At the core, metal scaffolding, which has a sprinkler that trickles water, and as it freezes over, the water stream gets turned up a little bit. As long as it continues to stay cold, the tree continues to grow. According to the Gaylord Herald Times, the ice tree has reached a circumference of at least 25 feet so far this year. If you do stop by, snap a picture, upload it to our winter weather bubble on burst.com slash up north live. Joe, some crazy weather this morning, but we're in for a little bit of a break. Finally, a little break. Yeah. Absolutely. A lot of kids had school off today. I don't think they're going to be as lucky tomorrow. Oh, man. Yeah, I know that feeling. Uh, let's take a look, though, in Traverse City. One thing I noticed, it's still daylight out, and it's like quarter after six. Summer's here. <laughs> well, kind of. <laughs> uh, it is going to be a little quieter, but the days are lengthening. I think we've already picked up between the morning and the night somewhere around 25, 30 minutes uh, since the first day of winter. Kind of cloudy here. A few breaks looking at live in Traverse City from our NMC Skyview network. These breaks will become more frequent tonight in the cloud cover. But with that being the case, as we clear tonight, we're going to also see kind of a chilly night. 
The snow is over with uh, for the most part. There's just a little bit hanging on here in Presque Isle County, northern Montmorency County, but the rest of the area dry as low pressure is finally pinwheeling out of here and away from northern Michigan. There's just a little bit of snow now uh, coming down to here, still from Rogers City. So again, snow is just about to enter town. You might get clipped with this down toward Alpena, the Presque Isle area. Not a lot. This is the end of it, and once this moves off, uh, we should see pretty quiet weather. There's the center of that system that rolled through our region. They are dealing with that now up through New England. Lots of freezing rain and sleet tonight in Maine, back through Vermont into upstate New York. But again, that is moving away from us. So we expect uh, the weather to be quite a bit quieter the next couple of days. Winds are coming in from the northwest behind that system and it is dragging in some colder weather. Notice up here north of Lake Superior, we have single digits and even below zero right now. Uh, temperatures. So we're dragging that in. I don't think we'll get quite that cold, uh, but we are going to see a little bit of a cool down tonight, more so through the day tomorrow. Weather-wise, very quiet. A few flurries expected in the Grand Traverse area along Lake Michigan. Inland areas will clear out. It's going to be a cold start to the day tomorrow, but dry. Things pretty quiet. Some flurries near Lake Michigan are possible Wednesday night. And then Thursday, we turn our winds around back out of the south and that will warm things back up again on Friday. We'll be in the teens and 20s tomorrow. Friday, we should jump back up into the 40s to end the week. Clearing skies, single digits. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised we get a few below zero readings here coming in by morning across the UP and lower Michigan. Atlanta, 7, 8 at Petoskey, 17 for Leland tonight. Partial clearing as the night goes on, Baldwin, 19. Tomorrow, the coldest day of the week, but still not all that bad. Uh, temperatures in the teens to around 20 degrees. Grayling, 21 there in Crawford County. Bel Air, 22 down through Mancelona. Kalkaska, 21. And at Baldwin, 26 there in Lake County tomorrow. Flurries near Lake Michigan. There's the warm-up. So the, you see Wednesday and Thursday a little cooler. And then Friday, we jump back up into the 40s. We expect some melting. We may even in lower Michigan see mid and upper 40s on Friday. Uh, so a warm-up late in the week. No big storms coming in. Could see a few snow showers Sunday uh, to end the weekend. It's another big number on Friday, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, warming right back up. So a little cool down, but it doesn't last very long. And yeah, Friday warming right back up. Thanks, Joe. Mm -hmm. Be sure to get up to the minute weather forecast for all across northern Michigan by downloading our Up North Live mobile app. It is free. Comes a live look at the radar. Search Up North Live in your app store, and you can download it right now. Coming up in sports, we have some movement in the latest high school basketball rankings. So we had some big games a week ago, did the latest poll positions today, plus one Red Wing playing red hot right now. Just back from North Korea tonight, the view from inside one of the most secretive places on Earth, what it wants the world to see and what the reality of life there is. Plus, are e-cigarettes safer than traditional cigarettes? What a major panel of experts revealed tonight. Basement Technologies. We knew with two top 10 showdowns a week ago in girls basketball that we were going to have some changes in the state rankings, and now we have our answers. Gaylord St. Mary is on the move after defeating Bel Air last week in the Ski Valley Conference. Snowbirds jump up from number nine to number six in the latest Class D polls. Plenty of area teams featured in those Class D polls. All records are as of Monday morning. Harbor Springs Harbor Light Christian leads the way with a fourth place rank at 11-0. The Snowbirds follow them at 6, with Bel Air falling to number 9 this week. Cedarville and Hillman just outside the top 10, as honorable mentions. Moving up to the higher classes in girls basketball, Kingsley impress is, Kingsley's impressive win over Glen Lake on Friday night doesn't move them up the Class B polls. The 10-0 Stags remain number three, with Gladwin receiving honorable mention. In Class C, St. Ignis remains at number two, entering a matchup tonight with Cedarville. Glen Lake falls just a few spots to number eight after its first loss of the season to the Stags. The Frankfurt boys basketball team had another busy week in the Northwest Conference, but couldn't escape without a loss. They lost to Glen Lake on Thursday. The Panthers First loss drops them down to number five in the latest Class D poll, while Glen Lake gets honorable mention votes in Class C. Taking a look at all our ranked boys teams now, Petoskey's 9-1 start has the North Minute honorable mention in Class A. The 9-0 McBain Ramblers holding strong at the number one position in Class C, with the Lakers as honorable mention, as we mentioned before. In Class D, 8-0 Hillman comes in at number four with the Panthers 
right behind them. Don't look now, but the Red Wings are piecing together some good performances, at least with Peter Mrazek in net. He's had two shutouts in goal the last two games he started, last night against New Jersey and nine days ago against the Chicago Blackhawks. He's the first goalie to record consecutive scoreless games since Dominic Hasek did it back in 2008. Wings will look to build off some of that momentum when they play a back-to-back -back in hosting Philadelphia tonight. Puck drop at 7.30. To go along with those highlights, we'll bring you high school hoop highlights. Traverse City St. Francis boys at home taking on East Jordan while Traverse City West girls playing Cadillac and the North Bay Co-op girls going up against Donekma. All those highlights tonight during sports at 11. That's going to do it for us now, though. We'll be right back. Salon services are provided by Epiphany Salon and Spa, Traverse City, and Epiphany East, Acme. Husky, Marianne Hoffman sent that one in. A little snowy, also a little cold. You can see that steam coming off little Traverse Bay. Very nice. Jumps out at you, yeah. Is that what, does it, Harrison? Some of that sky matches your tie tonight, too, Joe. Oh, well, well, th well, thank you for Interesting that, observation, nice. Harrison. <laughs> uh, recap on that forecast. A little cooler tomorrow, partly cloudy skies. It looks quiet, really, the rest of the week. Notice that we do get a warm-up. We're back into the 40s on Friday, so a little thaw to end the week. And, of course, we'll have a, another look at that coming up tonight at 11. All right, very good. Thanks, Joe. And thanks so much for making 740 Choice for News tonight. We'll see you back here at 11.